All right, welcome back. <clears throat> I did a quick switch in the calendar, if you guys noticed. I was planning to do mobile manipulation today because I want you guys to consider that a viable thing for your projects. But I, I got so frustrated making the demos and trying to use make every demo without motion planning, and I was like, this is killing me. I, I have to just do motion planning so that I can make better demos with mobile manipulation. So I'm gonna do uh, motion planning this week, but let me just put in a quick plug that since the previous projects are very much table-based manipulation, and a lot of the things we talk about are sort of table-based manipulation, and that's kind of, um, you know, my biases, I think, are towards the dynamics and control of manipulation. But there's another view of manipulation, a bigger view of, of manipulation, really, which I think um, sometimes doesn't think about the dynamics as much as I'd like, but but does think about bigger kind of world, you know, manipulation in the wild, in the world. So let me just, as an example, if you think about like Habitat 2, the Facebook, the meta um, project, they have robots that are trying to run around, you know, more like randomly generated home environments or scanned, many, many scanned home environments, right? And, and the problems in this, in this world are, you know, go find the milk in the refrigerator and put it on the table. You know, and, and the actual dexterity, for this was a, look at that, that's still the jello, that's still YCB right there. That's the same, you know, six objects that I use in my examples. Uh, but <clears throat> consider a wheeled robot. I'll give you models of wheeled robots. Um, I'll be pushing them out uh, in this next week. And uh, I think most of the assets that are out there in the, in the world can be brought into Drake, certainly if they're, um, just environment assets and they're fixed and you don't have to worry about how good their inertial properties are or material properties. If you just want to not run into things, that comes in easy. You will be surprised and disappointed when you bring in things that are supposed to have inertia and then they don't have inertia. Um, a lot of, yeah, we have things you can do in Drake to fill in the inertias if they're not provided, but uh, yeah, I'm always surprised at how many assets are out there in the world that are not yet ready for simulation. They just don't have all the properties specified. A lot of things are, you know, are geometry only, and you need to fill in coefficients of friction, inertias, and things like that. But we'll help you, um, you know, ingest your assets. That's part of the things, that's why we want to get you started early on the projects. If you have your pre-proposal and you're like, I'd love to use this sort of content, I could be, I could try to start helping that process. Okay? So, um, I'll give the mobile manipulation lecture Last, next week, and we'll talk about some of the details about the things that change, the, the assumptions we've made that will break once you're moving around the world. Um, but I need motion planning to make that cool. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about motion planning today in two parts. Okay, so I, um, there's really two, I'd say, dominant different approaches to motion planning. The first one is using optimization. I like optimization, so I put that first. But there's also a view of doing sample-based planning, okay, which we'll talk about next week. And actually, they come together in some nice ways, too. And, uh, and we'll finish off next, uh, sorry, on Thursday now, uh, putting them all together. <clears throat> so let me motivate this by, well, we had a question uh, last time, like, why are your demos, why are your robots and your demos moving so slowly? Okay, that's one motivation. So we're going to try to do better than, than that this time. Um, but also, if you... It was actually a, just a weakness, even though I gave a sort of a complete clutter clearing demo, including the task level that sort of reasoned about things when they, when they dropped, and they even got out of a jam when the, when the lack of motion planning screwed things up, but there were still motion planning failure, failures as one of the dominant failures in that demo, like the thing that would just cause that robot to do something really silly. A lot of times it was, you know, I picked up a, an object there, I wanted to set it down here, and because I just made kind of a simple straight line motion between the two, the robot would basically try to fold itself in on itself, uh, on a, you know, and, and would, its Jacobian would become nearly singular, and sometimes things would go really bad, okay? Um, it would also occasionally run into the cameras, just if I got particular, I tried to pick sort of a, you know, an arc that would rarely hit the cameras, but sometimes those, you know, especially the, the hand or the box that it was holding or whatever would hit the camera. Okay, so um, we're going to try to do better today. We're going to give um, a, 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 the beginnings of a big toolbox for planning motions that can operate potentially up at the speed limits of the robot, 
Certainly they try to avoid collisions, although you'll see in the notes, I, I don't like the, the problem formulation of collision-free motion planning. This is a super common thing. This is what robotics do is they, you know, they play, um, well, I'm, I'm too old, but do you, do you guys remember the game I, from my childhood of, it's called Operation, where there's a little guy with a red nose and you have the tweezers and you can't hit the, you know, so robots do that all the time. They're like moving through the world absolutely, essentially, you know, trying not to touch any part of their body anywhere in the world. And that's a bad place to be, but that's where we're going to start. We're going to try to avoid collisions completely with the world because ultimately we made a, we've got to make our robots just better at bumping into things and not exploding when they do. Okay, so yeah, so if you want to just move fast, so like um, Dexai I told you about before is a startup that's doing food preparation. Um, they got, uh, they were using a lot of reasonable motion planning. We gave them some slightly better motion planning based on trajectory optimization. And now they're like scooping twice as fast and they're very happy. Actually, since that quote, we got a new version of that to them and they're moving even twice as fast again and they're very, very happy. You know, so, um, so if you're, goal is to be a robot moving back and forth, then you can do a lot better than what we've told you about so far. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about, um, I was actually, I did not expect that to actually. Yeah, so, you, so let's start here and I'll go back to the other one. So I actually want to start the motion planning discussion by sort of finishing the discussion about inverse kinematics because the if you know inverse kinematics in the way that I want you to know inverse kinematics, thinking of it a little bit more generally than, than what's starting on the board here, then that's actually most of what you need to think about uh, optimization-based motion planning. Okay, so forward kinematics, as we've learned so far, is just a map that gives me a pose as a function Right I, of my joint positions, right? And if I can, if I want the pose of a certain body, maybe it's the pose in the world. Then I'll, I'll annotate this. And this is just a, a function. This function is always well defined for any joint angles. I can tell you where the body B is, right? If B could be my gripper, it could be any body in the in the robot. That function is always, you know, for every Q there is an X. It exists. It's nice. Um, <clears throat> inverse kinematics, the way you would start to think of it, and the thing we'd avoided doing before, would be something like trying to operate on this object, right? To say, given the, um, given x, I'd like to, maybe I should write x b here, and I'm trying to kick out a Q, right? This is a perfectly good definition of inverse kinematics. This is the standard definition of inverse kinematics. But this mapping is complicated, okay? Even for our standard six or seven degree of freedom arms, it doesn't tend to have a unique solution, right? It can have no solutions. If I say I want my hand to be somewhere that I can't reach, then it's gonna have no solutions, right? If it's outside the workspace. But even if, I'm, if I pick a very reasonable sort of configuration XB, there can be many solutions, right? See what I'm trying to do there? I think r robots do it better than me, but you know what I mean? My hand is not moving, roughly, and I've got a lot of different angles that could potentially give the same solution. So when I see this, I, I say, you know, you haven't done your homework. You, you haven't fully specified the problem in some sense. That's just a partial specification. There's many cues that could satisfy that. Okay, um, it is good to know about these. So actually, uh, Tommy couldn't come today, but he's, uh, Tommy's an expert in analytical IK and, uh, and trying to, he could tell you exactly for, you know, you tell him the robot, he'll tell you like how many solutions this, this map has, okay, and he can tell you exactly how to use them beautifully, if you, and he loves to talk about it. So um, you should ask him if you're interested. <coughs> There's a lot of good things to know about that. Um, one of the things that you should know about that is the case of a six degree of, I mentioned this quickly the other day, but the, for a six degree of freedom robot arm, you can make a few choices in the redundancy parameters, a few standard choices, and basically 
people treat it as if that inverse is well defined for a six degree of freedom robot and a pose in the end effector. You have six, you know, X, Y, Z, roll pitch yaw, you're trying to specify, you have six joint angles. That's the case where as long as you pick a, a few redundancy parameters, say I want this elbow position instead of this elbow position, there's basically a closed form solution. <coughs> okay, so. It's not every six off robot, but the standard serial chain six off robots. If you came up with six joints that were connected in some crazy linkage or something like this, that would not be true. But the standard revolute, revolute kind of uh, links, that is true. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. It's a beautiful question. So, so, um, so in the cases where there are finitely many solutions, which the six to off is a case, you could just imagine outputting all eight of them in mean, the standard. Um, you could certainly do that. There's certainly cases where you have infinite solutions. Even then, people have ways to output that infinite solution. You give it the the finite solutions, and then a witness function for the dimension that is basically the infinite. The you know, um, yes, I think everything there is possible. Uh, your motivation for saying it, just to repeat it for the microphone and everything, is that, um, yeah, so there might be cases where I want to pick a different solution because there's like a closet here or something that I don't want to bump into, or a table or something I don't want to bump into. And that is also my motivation for trying to specify this in the language of optimization, because we're going to, I agree with you, I think only specifying the end effector is not sufficient. But in your proposal, you would first satisfy the end effector and then start considering the other constraints, I want to consider them jointly. Good? Yes. Awesome. Okay, but it is good to know that, that you can do, IK, you can do an, you know, analytic IK, closed form IK for, uh, for a six DOF manipulator. Most of our robots out there are seven DOF. So a standard approach that was made popular by this package IK fast, Just cited in the notes um, gives you something. People say I have an analytic solution for the seven degree of freedom. They don't. They they actually sample in the in the last degree of freedom, and then that's it's okay. It's easy to sample in one degree of freedom, and then you call the IK, which is fast for the other six. So it's almost like you have a closed form solution, you know, uh, for the seven off. But that still requires some sampling. But as we say, we want to do a little bit more than that. We want to rewrite these problems with the language of optimization so that we can uh, jointly optimize the end effector with other concerns. Uh, I did, just to get, not get ahead of myself, so I did want to uh, you know, I'll just mention that the world of sort of understanding these solutions, even in really complicated kinematics, is actually very mature. This is kind of what roboticists did in the 1980s. Uh, I guess they did other things too, but this was a big thing that they did in the 1980s. They kind of completely understood kinematics and dynamics of our multiple chain manipulators, even when they're like, you know, got closed kinematic chains and everything like this. And if you care, the, 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 one of the interesting pieces that powered that, this line of work was the observation that kinematics of rigid bodies are actually polynomials. Um, even though you normally see sines and cosines the way we write them, you can write things as the rigid body constraint is, is effectively a constraint saying that this point and this point are a certain distance away. So there's, their square distance is a constant. That's just a polynomial equation. And every time you add degrees of freedom, you're just adding sort of more polynomial equations and constraints. So you can write down the kinematics, these kinematics problems as big polynomial equations. And then you can find the roots of the polynomials to solve interesting kinematics problems. And that's where you get into like these witness functions where so the way they would solve for every possible solution is, you know, there's a bunch of cool tools from algebraic geometry that can help you solve that. Numerical algebraic geometry, even. So um, 
this is actually, oh yeah, I said it right there. Numerical algebraic geometry and algebraic kinematics. That's actually a great reference if you, if you care. But um, lots of clever things with you know, nice math and cool robots. For instance, if you want to like optimize the link length in order to have your four bar linkage go through a certain shape curve, you, like you, can, you can do that right, with these tools, which is pretty cool. OK, but I want to advocate for a bigger view of um, optimization, so I, uh, uh, you know, optimization-based view of inverse kinematics. So instead of writing this, I want to write it um, a bit more like this. Right? I want to minimize over Q, subject to the forward kinematics being satisfied. And I almost always write a very simple objective, something like this. Okay, this would be my my straightforward transposition of that second inverse kinematics into like the optimization spelling of that. Okay, and all I'm saying is now the reason this is a little bit more complete of a specification than that one. So Q not for me is a comfortable position of the robot. Okay, so. Pick your favorite sort of happy position. Maybe not this one, not this one. You know, something that's just a comfortable position. And I'd like to say of the possible solutions, you know, of the possible solutions that satisfy this equation, I'd like the one that is closest to my comfortable position. Okay? We're going to add other things in here too. Yeah? Right. So, so my recommendation, my strong recommendation is leave this one alone. That's like, you know, keep that one simple. Your objective, simple. This is like a, a recommendation for life, not just kinematics. So I, if RL could handle constraints, I would recommend it for RL. If, you know, in general, the writing optimization problems, you get into games of cost function tuning. If you start saying, I'd like, I got this, and I don't want to hit this, and I'm going to say like 0 0.9 times don't bump into something, you know, plus, and you get like 0 0.072, you know, whatever, and, and I don't like to play those games, right? So I like to try to keep, because it's, it's really, yeah, it's messy and hard. So I try to keep the objective super simple, and if there's something that is a constraint, like being inside the table is a constraint, so I would rather list it as a constraint. So like plus non-penetration, penetration, yeah, you guys laughed last time I said that, non-collision. How about that? Non-collision, et cetera. Yeah. Yes, you should definitely, the richer form of, of inverse kinematics allows you to add these additional constraints. Cost if you really must, but I think most of the things we think about are actually constraints. Yeah. doesn't strictly, the question is, does Q um, nominal, oh, sorry, it definitely doesn't have to satisfy this. This is just a nominal, you know, so let me, I'll show it in the, in the humanoid case, okay? So um, I called it Q desired uh, on this. Uh, Q desired for Atlas is just like Atlas standing like this, okay? <laughs> and then, you know, it's because, because when I'm reaching out or something, you know, when, when all things are equal, I want to be like, in a comfortable position. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be like this. Just some nominal position. It's not satisfying any of the constraints. Okay? But then you add things like, I'd like my hand to be here. And this is in a, in a user interface. Pat Marion was pulling the hand around. Okay? Um, you can have joint limits. That's another thing that would cause you to pick one solution or another. Um, collision avoidance, for sure. We had a bunch of things like um, gaze constraints. I think I, uh, <coughs> I mentioned once that um, Atlas the first version of Atlas, in fact, no, this is the second version, but the first version of Atlas, um, the hands could only touch each other right around here, but the head could barely see where the hands could touch. So it was like, you know, it was actually pretty important to try to pick places where your head could look, right? Uh, right? You want your feet to stay put often when you're reaching around, that's a pretty easy one. You want your center mass to be somewhere in your support polygon. These are all kinematic constraints, and imp importantly, they can be written, you know, as for instance, G of Q 
q greater than or equal to zero, some nonlinear function that only depends on q. It doesn't depend on velocities, it doesn't depend on accelerations, it doesn't depend on torques, it doesn't depend on you know, other things. Those, everything I listed there is just a kinematic quantity. Yes? Or like spot. Yep. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. So um, there's, there's a case, yeah. So um, I talked about task prioritization where you yeah. put a small epsilon, right? So you could, have, you could put something in the null space of a constraint. That's also, in my mind, that's still clean. You're, you're, you're giving a strict task prioritization and you're putting a, the second objective in the null space. I would allow that here too. I just, the blending of costs is a, a more messy business. Arbitrary blending of costs. Okay, so this is the our our goal is to have optimization problems that look a little bit like this. Now, um, I mean, I guess we've already identified this the potential problem, right? So if this is a solution and this is a solution, right? And maybe this isn't. I mean, okay, there's cases. My my arm's a little too squishy, so I can go all the way around. But some robot the robots should have finite solutions in the seven stuff. Um, and it's got one complete redundancy parameter and then multiple discrete solutions. Uh, this is an ugly optimization problem, is my, is my point, right? So uh, when I, even if I just had this for my robot, it could be that the optimization landscape is not particularly nice. We could have local minima, for instance. So I want to work through that in a few examples because it's going to be the same kind of local minima that show up in our trajectory optimization problems, our kinematic optimization, motion planning problems. Okay, but let's first put it to use. So um, I've got this little interactive notebook here. I don't know why I closed it. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna put, I'm gonna do almost the same thing we did before. Remember we had a teleop in like the first chapter where I could just command the end effector and the robot would track? We used differential IK to do that. I'm gonna do the same thing with inverse kinematics. Okay, and we're gonna see, I think, a couple examples of why that's not, why we chose diff IK before, but why we have a more powerful tool here if we choose to go this way, okay? Um, All right, I've got my little keyboard here. So I'm just stepping the end effector position. I didn't make it quite as smooth this time because I'm thinking about in, in position space and discrete steps in position instead of the velocities that are being simulated, okay? But I'm just calling, I'm writing that optimization down. I'm solving it with SNOP, which is one of our nonlinear optimization packages. I'm just writing down this, basically, okay? And I'm, and I'm running and it can, basically solve the same kind of problems that we saw before. So I have X, Y, Z here. I can go up and down, right? And then I can do yaw, pitch, and roll, right? And this is solving as fast as I can press the button, right? Solves at interactive rates, and it's solving apparently the same problem. Yeah. I'm not actually running a simulation. The reason it's stepping disc discreetly, before I was running the physics engine, I was sending the velocity command to the controller and it was simulating the motion. Here I'm just plotting the solution that comes out of this. That's why it's jumping. I could certainly turn that into a position command and do the whole thing, but you'll see, I want to emphasize the jumps in a second here, so that's why I chose to visualize it slightly differently. Okay. Um, the. 
the interface is, is very simple. It almost, you get to almost write things like this, okay? We, even ha we have an inverse kinematics class that just sets up the problem for you, so you don't have to start with mathematical program. You could start with inverse kinematics. It adds this constraint, these kind of constraints for you immediately. And it actually has this rich library of costs and constraints. You could add position constraints, orientation constraints, gaze target constraints, angle between vector constraints, minimum distance constraint. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, um, point to distance, all kinds, you know, all kinds of constraints you can add to this problem. And to show off what that can potentially do, let's try something a little bit more interesting here. Oh, so first, let me say that this is the this is like basically the entire problem that I solved so far. I took the command from the sliders, okay? I said that that's my desired pose, okay? Is, is I've got a position constraint saying the gripper frame zero, zero is in the desired pose, which the lower bound and upper bound are both the desired pose, and the orientation of the gripper is in the desired rotation, okay? Solve. I, and I added the quadratic cost saying Q minus Q zero squared is my, is my cost. Just a few lines of code, yeah. So the question is about, um, yes, so I think the short answer is that when you add a minimum distance constraint, a collision avoidance constraint, then it is doing smart things behind the scenes in order to try to do, it's not KD tree, it's a axis aligned bounding box uh, broad face collision detection, but it does try to, uh, it gives you an interface to say the thresholds on that and it will do, do the smart stuff for you. Okay. Uh, all right, so now let's add one of the, let's do the same kind of demo, but now I'm gonna put in an obstacle, okay? And here's the difference between diff IK and IK. Right? Diff IK is only thinking about incremental changes, right? So I guess the interesting case would be if I, I don't know, go forward a little bit and then try to start moving this way. So first of all, it's pretty cool that it can avoid those collisions, right? It's gonna do its best to avoid the collisions. But at some point, the solutions have to jump. It's, it doesn't like it in the middle, right? Come on, come on, there it goes, there you go. Okay, at some point it jumps across to the other side. Now that is exactly a local minima, right? So the, the solutions had to change from one set of solutions it was happy with. It had to get worse, meaning it had to violate a constraint of, of non-collision in order to get to the other side and be successful again. Now it, it'd be perfectly happy if I walked back towards the other side. Well, not so happy. Oh, I'm going, going up, I'm pressing the wrong button. That was my user error, sorry. Pretty confused now. I'm pretty confused. Let me restart that. <laughs> yeah, see that was less user error, and you see the symmetry there, right? Okay, so this is a different tool. Now, but, but okay, but watch carefully though. So it solved, it, this is not a solution. It's gonna, it's saying this is, I did my best effort to satisfy your, uh, your constraints, but was not able to, okay? And then it found another solution, and it, it even jumped back and forth between one of those. This is why you don't just wanna call IK and send it right to the robot, right? Diff IK is explicitly what you want if you wanna make incremental changes in the joint positions. You could do a bit better by instead of sending Q0 being always the same comfortable position. You said my current Q and my next Q. But still, it's possible the solver will find a different solution just because it's non-convex optimization and it's, just, it's doing its best effort to solve it. Okay? Now, there's one more point I really wanna make, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, think hard about the way you write your I mean, I think this is pretty standard. You can sort of fire and forget. This is given, okay? But think, think carefully about the way you wanna ask for the things you want, you must, your robot must do. And in particular, 
you should try to write the minimal constraints possible to accomplish the task. For instance, if you remember when we were doing the GRASP optimization, right? I had sort of an objective in the kind of a messy thing that I said I wasn't going to write on the board. It was too messy, right? Um, for the sample-based planner that said, I kind of like coming in from the top. Um, I would, it would be bad for me to say you must be in at exactly 90 degrees. That would be over, because there might be a solution that avoided some collision that came in at you know, 92 degrees or something like that. And if I'd said it must be exactly 90 degrees, then you would have ruled out that solution. Okay? So oftentimes, the thing you need to accomplish the task is actually a pretty light touch specification. So just to make an example of that, I wrote one here of grasping a cylinder, okay? So think of it as a handrail or, or something, but uh, so if I want the hand to be on the cylinder, I don't actually care what orientation it is, okay? I don't even care where it is along the cylinder. So if you write the objective, the constraints correctly, then you can, you get a beautiful sort of manifold of solutions. So let me see if, now I've got the, um, yeah, see, I've got the sliders moving the cylinder now, the, and you know, the handlebar, and the robot's just solving these inverse kinematics. And it just says, I'd like to be in some comfortable position with the cylinder inside, but I'm not specifying the orientation, right? Okay, so that was IK's slight weirdness there. But, um, so having written it correctly, I think, now, you know, it will track, it'll move in that dimension only when needed, okay? Is that clear, right? If I had said solve for the position on the grasp, uh, on the handlebar, and then call IK with exactly that position, then I would have overly constrained the, the solution choice, right? It's much better to leave that freedom left for, for the inverse kinematics to solve. I think I can also, like, antagonize the robot here. Limbo. Oops, that's a failure. Anyways, it does pretty. It does a pretty good job. Like, and these things solve at interactive rates. You can run this, you know, online on a humanoid, for instance. Okay, but they are local optimizations, and they can get stuck in local minima. Okay, there's a huge library of cost and constraints, center mass position, even bigger than the inverse kinematics library, but. Um, Okay, let's just think about how I wrote that particular one, okay? So, you remember I put this up, this is the old figure from you know, an old lecture here, so just to remember that the, the frame on the chunk hand is kind of weird. So RGB, XYZ, right? Red, green, blue, so this is the y, positive Y axis. Okay? So what I wanted to say was that the and, and the positive Y, it was like 0.1. It was like 10 centimeters from the gripper frame to the, the where the fingers are, okay? So what I wanted to say was that the cylinder, right, that the, the position that is in the a gripper frame, okay, is basically in the center line of the cylinder. So I can write that by saying that the position, this point Q mapped into the cylinder's frame is between, well, okay, Let's ignore that last line first. So the x, y position, there's zero and zero. Now I wanted to get a little clever and write just one constraint that also handled the fact that the cylinder has finite length. Okay, so what I said to do that was I said, there's a point, let me see if I can draw it in the, um, in the off axis, just to make sure you see what I'm trying to say here. So when I'm looking down um, at the fingers of the robot here, okay? There's a point here, which is the, uh, the point, point one, zero, point two, and there's a point just right here in the frame of the gripper. And I'm saying I'd like both of those to be inside the cylinder, which is actually defined as the center of the cylinder, which happens to be a meter long, okay? So there's a cylinder frame here. I'm saying, you know, I should have, let's say that this is the center of the cylinder. I'll chop it off here. Okay, this, this whole thing is a meter. So I'm saying this point has to be on the center line of the cylinder, 
and can be in this axis between positive 0.5 and negative 0.5. So with that one constraint, which is this now this position, add a position constraint. So there's two constraints because I have, I do it for this point and this point. I've done everything I need to specify that richer objective of trying to reach around the cylinder. Did I say that well enough? I could have added an orientation constraint, but then I would have had to add a different separate constraint for the length of the cylinder. So by adding just the two points that effectively constrained my rotation and also handled the side to side. And it said exactly what I needed for the, for the rail and nothing more. So if I, some other obstacle came in and I needed to reach the handrail from the, from the bottom, it was free to do that. Yeah? What's the G frame? The gripper. Q is the point on the gripper, which is either, the, it's those two purple points I just drew there. And C is the cylinder. Yeah, thank you for asking. I used the first letter, it's clear in my head, but I should say it. Yes. Yeah. I see. That's why I use the word handrail because you're right. If I were to, if I were thinking of it as a cylinder that I had to hold, that that would not be a very good one. So okay. So the the first thing is that that probably is a, uh, requires thinking about forces. I mean, you could do it purely kind of heuristically, saying I need to be near the center, but, it, but the real constraint there is a static stability kind of constraint. So it, it wouldn't be quite in the language of kinematics, right? So you would need positions and forces to think about that in a, in a precise way, right? You want to be in force balance. So you could do totally write that. That would, be, that would be the preferred way to write that. If you wanted to do a more heuristic thing, then you could say something about I mean, it would be a threshold on the, I guess you could convert all those constraints into purely kinematic constraints. I still think you would, um, I would prefer to figure out the threshold at which it would start rotating, given an approximation of the friction, rather than starting to muck with the objective, which I think is the fundamental part of your question. That's, I, I can't say that that's just obviously right. That's just a lesson I've learned over the years, having spent time tuning cost functions and becoming unhappy, finding myself a little bit less unhappy in this approach. Okay. Is that kind of clear? It's a little bit, you know, got to get your head around it, but I think that's uh, a pretty good example. And it's not running. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's just two add position constraint calls, and it did all that kind of thinking. Okay, the one that... Um, you're asking about here uh, is you can add this one heavy duty constraint if you want, which is to say that the minimum d distance between all possible bodies is at least greater than some number. This is a hammer that allows you to add things saying I'm not in collision. And it'll go through, conceptually, it will go through all n squared, if we're, n is the number of possible bodies, okay, and any body can potentially collide with any other body, then it'll check all of them, it will compute their distance, and it will make sure that the smallest distance is greater than that threshold. So if you said the minimum distance is one centimeter, then you're out of collision by at least one centimeter in all the places. In practice, you can set filters so that you're not checking all n squared. And in practice, we're using clever data structures to quickly rule out so you're not paying the n squared cost. Okay. But, but that, is a, that is intuitively what it is doing, and it's just making that computationally efficient. Yeah? That's a really good question. Okay, so, so picking stuff up is a pain. It's, it's, like, it's kind of the point in manipulation, you know, I admit that, but um, if you're doing collision-free motion planning, with optimiz it's, it's like we have this beautiful framework, right? You basically say you get really close, avoiding collisions, and then you turn off the collisions between your finger and the object in order to pick it up. Or you stop doing your beautiful optimization, you close your eyes and you just squeeze your hand. 
yeah, you caught me. That's like a, that's a, that is a place that everybody has slightly gross code in the last little bit where they close their fingers around the object, I would say. Sample-based planners, optimization-based planners, there's a little fudge there uh, to make that happen. Yeah. Or you can shrink the obstacle by some amount so that you think you're in, not in collision, and, but you're actually touching the There's all kinds of games people play, but that is always a little inelegant. There's a full dynamic way to do it where you're allowed to make contact, but you're, if you're playing the collision-free motion planning game, then you do have to do something to address that. Good question. Okay, so I want to um, just think about what the, I mean, the minimum distance constraint is p potentially the most uh, powerful, but also the most problematic in the sense of adding complexity to the optimization landscape. So let's just do like a simple example to think about like what that geometry can potentially look like. Um, imagine, I'll do it over here, I guess, okay. Uh, the simplest sort of example I can come up with. I'm putting a double, a two-link robot, okay. Uh, this is sort of theta one, Q1, this is Q2, okay. And I'm going to give it um, length one, length two, and I'll give this only, the only geometry of interest is this a ball at the end, which is a radius R. Okay, and I'm going to put it between two walls, which is not a standard thing to do with a pendulum, I admit. But, but you know, this is uh, motivated by, let's say, uh, uh, my robot reaching into a shelf, which is the bigger example I'll do in a minute. Okay, but let's say I've just got a two-link pendulum stuck between two walls, <laughs> because this is something I can plot, right? It's got two configuration variables, and I can look at what are the set of Cues that could possibly be collision free. Because that's what this constraint is. If I say the minimum distance, if I want to be out of constraint, then what are the set of cues that could be collision free? And here is that set, okay? So I can change these variables around and just think about what is the shape of that set. Uh, so for instance, if I bring the walls closer together or move them farther apart, and I can make this a pretty, you know, curvy. Okay, so if I if the walls are too close together compared to the radius, for instance, then at some point I'll have no solution. Does that make sense? Right? When I open it up a little bit, then I've got a this small wedge of solutions. When I move them very far apart, then I have all solutions. And there's this kind of interesting place where um, just run in, in, a, in a few corners of my workspace, I can, I can bump into things. Okay, that's the closed form solution with a collision free configuration space of this super simple example. And the point is, you know, it's a, it's a curvy, you know, potentially complicated object. That one doesn't look so scary. That one looks weird and kind of like as a, as a you know, optimization landscape to say, uh, well, like if I have an initial guess here, but my solution's over here, that's a pretty scary undertaking potentially, right? Okay, <laughs> I'll try to visualize a few more things too. But um, here's so here's now the slightly bigger example, which I can I can almost I can plot this one. It's just going to be a lot messier. Okay. The way I can make this um, plot, I made this, you'll see this sometimes, I have a planar EWA in the manipulation notes. So I took all of the, it's normally seven links, I took all the ones that are out of plane and I froze them. I just made them a weld joint. So I have three links left and the robot can only live in the, in the plane. Just like I did for that uh, kinematic singularity sort of animation. Okay, and there's a little point here, a, a little sphere there. Um, my goal is to try to be, have the fingers around the sphere. Here's the optimization, here's the configuration space, okay? So the first thing, let me turn off the collision constraint, make sure we understand what's happening here. So this is just the initial guess, the nominal comfortable position of the, so let me make sure you understand. So I just used MeshKit because I have a 3D visualizer, but I'm plotting, just like that last plot, I plotted Q versus Q1 versus Q2. Now I'm plotting Q1, Q2, Q3, and I'm just, filling in MeshCat with 
when things are in collision or not. Okay, so there's no robot space here. This is joint space. And so uh, the initial guess, uh, some comfortable position of that robot is just a point in this space. Okay, and the, um, the location, it, it turns out that the, um, well, let me, let me say it here. The, the final solution is also a point in this space, which comes out, which is this one here. Okay, that's the optimal solution that the optimizer finds. The grasp constraint, so the set of cues which put the hand in the correct position looks like this. Okay, which is actually not terrible. It's like this annulus, right? So um, it kind of, can I convince you that it's not too, so it's, it's, it sort of looks like this, right? So um, I've got my robot in this configuration and I can sort of keep it touching that same point if I rotate a little bit farther forward and lean a little bit farther back or if I lean a little farther back. You know, I can sort of get to the same relative position by just rotating around in that manifold. And that's this annulus here. And the reason it's clipped is because there's joint limits. Yeah? Uh, I, I said you must be there with some tolerance, which is why it has volume. Is that what you're asking? It would be a line if I said it to be, to be zero. I just wanted something I could visualize better. Yep, I made it thick. And, and then ran marching cubes on my sample data. Yeah. I would have, in a normal optimization, I could say I'd be there exactly, but then I just would have had trouble plotting it. Okay, but the big one, which is the sort of the, you know, comparable to what I just showed you, is this collision constraint, okay? So the set of states in that manifold where the robot is in collision is this terrible geometry, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's horrible, right? There's all these places where you could be in collision with shelf one, shelf two, whatever. It's terrifying. And the, the optimizer had to find a solution that was inside this little nook. You see it there? Whoop. I mean, you go, snot, right? Like, that's pretty good to find the, the sort of needle in the haystack. But that's what we're asking the solver to do on every frame, right? Is to reason about these really complicated geometries and really complicated landscapes. I actually plotted now the optimization landscape, okay? Just to see it a different way. So this is now, um, I picked two of the variables and I plotted the costs and constraints over those two variables, okay? And I, I, the point is really that it's complicated, I guess, right? So there's a solution. So there's a nice quadratic objective. That's just my Q minus Q naught. That part's simple, okay? But if you start popping in these constraints, then there's position constraint. That's beautiful and simple. There's the bounding box constraint for the joint limits. Those are fine. The heavy hitter here is this minimum distance constraint. That's the, adding all the complexity. Okay, yuck. Yeah, if you're an optimizer, you know, your mileage will vary. Okay, but it's, uh, I think people, you know, hope for a lot from the solvers and, and don't quite always think about how much you're asking. All right, we have a, I think, a deeper understanding of inverse kinematics now. And my claim is that that's most of what you need to know to do motion planning, optimization-based motion planning. Okay. And so the reason for that is, I mean, any other questions about this before I jump to the next step? The reason for that is that solving for a motion plan is really just solving for a handful of positions at the same time. Okay, so instead of solving for one Q, we're just gonna solve for N Qs. We're gonna ask that they be related just so they don't jump all over the place. And at every Q, we're gonna ask it to handle kinematic constraints, not be in collision, you know, be comfortable and close to my, and that's it, right? So 
and I, if I took my sort of curvy um, manifold of that robot, that was my configuration space, right? So this was Q1, Q2 of my double pendulum collision free. Configuration space, right? Finding inverse kinematic solutions is just finding a, one point in that space. Finding a motion plan is finding a sequence of points in that space. Let's say I want to start here and end over here. Then the kinematic motion planning, optimization-based motion planning, is find me a sequence of these points that all satisfy the constraints, and I will interpolate them nicely as into a path. That's the most important idea. Our choice of how we parameterize those intermediate points can dramatically affect the way that we write our costs and constraints. Okay, but essentially, you're going to be able to. You're gonna, the language that you have to write about this, uh, to write these things, is at a handful of points you're going to list the same inverse kinematics type costs and constraints. Yeah? Yes? I'm going to advocate, we're going to talk about the connections to A star and everything more in the sample-based world. In this case, we're going to be doing gradients and, and uh, optimization. Right? So, so um, the, you know, this picture here, this optimization landscape, if you think about what the solver's doing, it's taking some initial guess. It's trying to move down. It, you know, takes some initial guess. It's taking gradients. It's actually taking a second, uh, you know, the, the SNOP is a second order optimizer. So it's taking a quadratic approximation of the costs and the constraints. And it's taking a jump. And it's trying to move down this optimization landscape while staying out of the constraints. So it's a gradient-based sort of optimization. The same thing is going to be true here. It's going to start with some initial guess. Going deep in the colors today. Okay, I got some initial guess. Maybe it's got points that are you know all over the place here. And as the optimization is going, it's going to try to you know bring these things together into a coherent trajectory and make sure that all of them individually are satisfying the constraints. For instance, being inside this region. And that's just the same. It's a higher dimensional version of this. It's just walking down this landscape pushing itself out of the constraint violation and trying to minimize the objective. Okay. So here's kind of a, um, a simple version of that, a starter version of that. Okay, so let's take, now I've, I've changed geometries again. I hope that you guys are able to um, Stick with me when I'm changing. You know, so, so this this plot is now again Q1, Q2, but I made my robot a point, and I said the bad regions are when I'm in this red region. Okay, so now I want to be outside this red region. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> here's here's a basic optimization. I say like, maybe I know the starting location, and I know the ending location. So I can write a constraint saying that the first Q had better be at the start. The final Q had better be at the goal. Right? I'd like to say, let's space them relatively evenly. So I'm going to penalize just the distance between them. I did the square distance just for convenience, for subtle reasons on this one. If I did exactly the Euclidean distance, then there'd be a manifold of solutions. You could put all the points here, and then I'd take a big jump there. So the square distance spreads them out more evenly. That's a detail, okay? And then I said every one of those points, right, the decision variables for this are many Qs. And every one of those points, it happens that, this, that for, I chose this very simple to represent box because then it's just that if the magnitude of Q in the L1 norm is greater than one, then I'm outside of that region, okay? But in general, this is just my not, my ad minimum distance constraint. 
And that's it. Now we, that would find a solution that looks like this. Okay? It's in the same way as the other one, maybe even in more ways than the other, the original IK problem, this is potentially subject to local minima. That's why I chose a box in the middle, because I can make the local minima problem super clear. Right? So, uh, so now if I move the the costs, you know, the start and the goal around, right? That's all good. It's solving at interactive rates. That's fine. But then course, if I go to the other side here, this is still a solution, right? This is still a, this is a local optima in the trajectory optimization problem. Anything it does incrementally, if I make a small change to the position at any one of those points, I'm going to violate a constraint or I'm going to increase the cost, right? So the optimizer is going to declare success here because it satisfies all the constraints and is locally minimizing the objective. And that's the best it can do, really, in the way we've written the problem today. Of course, there's a better solution out there, but you would have to do worse. You'd have to move points through the, the constraint in order to get better again on the other side. So this is sort of the classic local minima in trajectory optimization. Yeah. I mean, it's a slightly more subtle, right? This one is connected. It's just non-convex, right? I could always, I could move around here. I think you're absolutely right to think about the, the geometry of that, but I think the proper geometry is something like the homotopy class of curves. If you're thinking in the class of points, this one, it, there's other cases where it won't be connected. This one is technically connected, but it's the curves which, sa which satisfy that constraint, which are not connected. Yeah. There's also, of course, some that go around multiple times and get there, right? The geometry of that problem, of that, the topology of that problem is interesting. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, good. So uh, the question was, was this happen? Would this still happen? So the reason I was able to like pull it so dramatically this way is that I was using the previous guess as the initial condition for the next guess, right? That was just my way of giving myself some control to push it, to knowingly push it into a, a local minima. If you started from a, the same initial guess, like a straight line up the middle every time, then sometimes it'll find this one, sometimes it'll find this one, but the problem is the same, right? If the solver initial guess is on the wrong side, it won't find it. And it's hard in these problems, generically, to come up with the initial guess that will be right for all your different op landscapes. Yeah? Awesome. So can we try a few different initial guesses and find the global minima? So uh, if you were to guess in the shape of curves, that would be a, the, the dimensionality of that space is very high. And effectively, your proposal is roughly what sample-based motion planning is doing. Right? However, you give something up. The, the, the richness of the costs and constraints that we have in optimization are harder to do in the sampling world. Okay? But the intuition you have is to, to, to yeah, to sample is roughly what sample-based motion planning does. Yes? So uh, he's, ironically, I will show you elegant solutions to the maze solving as an optimization next time. That's one of my examples. But, uh, but it's supposed to be surprising. So, so there you go. Uh, but, uh, but I think you're right. So you, can, you can make these problems very hard, right? And when you have 
humanoid robots trying to solve complicated constraints, they will slow down and your success will vary. You, you, won't, you can't guarantee it will find a solution if one exists, if you do the purely optimization view. The sampling have different types of uh, guarantees and limitations. Okay, so that's the most important idea here is that rich costs and constraints solve these optimizations, sequence them together and you have trajectories. The details there are about maybe how you parameterize that trajectory. Some of them allow you to do things like guarantee that the segments satisfy some constraints, right? If you choose clever trajectory parameterizations. So for instance, some of you have taken underactuated, for instance, and we have different types of parameterizations that we use when doing dynamic trajectory optimization, where the, the focus in dynamic trajectory optimization is more about satisfying dynamic constraints. So path curvature type constraints. In motion, in manipulation, we're doing kinematic trajectory optimization and you choose different parameterizations that are typically more dialed in to trying to, to uh, if you don't have to handle continuous curves in the same way and derivatives, then you can dial in trying to avoid or make stronger guarantees about the segments, for instance. So it's actually a slightly different answer than I advocate in the other class. Okay. So I'll tell you the, the I mean, there's, there's, people have different opinions and choices about what's efficient, what fits, what works well with their solver, you know, what you can guarantee, caring about car guarantees or not. Um, but I think a pretty standard choice would be to use a, a B-spline parameterization for this. People hear of B-spline before? B, uh, yeah, it's a funny thing, right? So it's, they're called B-splines. They're closely related to Bezier curves. But the B in B splines is not Bezier. It's, I, mean, I, think, I think the way I, I learned that is I said something about that in class one year, and people are like, you know, it's not Bezier. I'm like, you're kidding. And I looked it up, and I was like, oh my god, that's embarrassing. Yeah, it's related to Bezier curves. But this actually just stands for basis. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> um, so Bezier curves are a polynomial parameterization. So we already saw a couple of trajectory parameterizations, right? When we were just interpolating our keyframe trajectories, we used piecewise polynomials before, right? From this was our lecture four-ish. Remember when we did the keyframes? Okay. B splines are a different choice, but very similar. They're both polynomial parameterizations. The piecewise polynomial was saying that Q of T is some alpha K times T minus T um, to the K. So T nominal, let's say, this would be one piece of a piecewise polynomial. It is polynomial in time, but the coefficients that you're trying to search for, it's linear in the coefficients. We're going to search over coefficients. The B spline is a different polynomial choice for basis functions, those bases, okay, but it's still a sum over basis functions of, of t, and those are still polynomials. They're just a slightly more, they're different choice of polynomial bases, okay? It's, you can, in the same way, search over the coefficients. But this has a few nice properties, okay? The B spline, in particular, In the B spline basis, alpha k are called the control points. And 
and they have a geometric interpretation. So if I have Q0 and Q1, and I have like alpha 0 here, alpha 1 here, alpha 2 here, <coughs> even alpha 3 here, it turns out that the, the curve that, that you get by evaluating that basis starts at, at alpha 0, ends at alpha 3, and stays nicely inside the convex hull of those points. It's actually a moving convex hull, with, depending on the degree of the Bezier um, curve. So like this segment will be in the convex hull of those points. The next segment will be in the convex hull of these points, for instance. Okay. That's just a, you know, there's, a, there's so many polynomial bases, and they're all good at different things, you know, and the virtue of the beast lines is this, con is first and foremost, this convex hull property. Okay. This is the convex hull property. And the reason that's important is if you have something like joint limits, okay, then if you, it's easy to add a constraint saying that if all of my control points are inside my joint limits, then I can guarantee that my curve will not violate my joint limits. Guaranteed, right? Just by the convex hull property. So. It happens that, that the derivative, the time derivative of a Bezier, of a B-spline, is also a, a, a B-spline. So you can end velocity limits that, have, that are guaranteed to stay inside velocity limits for all time, acceleration limits, and so on. Sorry. Yes, so B splines have uh, they have a dimensionality. That would be the dimension of Q or the dimension of my control points. They have they have a number of points total, and they also have a degree or an order. People use different terms for that. And so the um, the property of the convex hull mathematically is that the um, I think it's the order minus one. Each pair each consecutive set of order minus one points. The convex hull of those points contains um, the curve, which is these, these basis functions are sparse, so they're only act, they're only non-zero for a finite set of uh, of points. For every one of those functions that the the the, the coefficients are non-zero, you're inside that. I, uh, I said uh, I said that badly, but here's it's actually not a deep observation in some sense. So n k is uh, greater than zero and can be normalized to one, okay, and it's sparse. That'll, that, uh, so that means that I'm taking an, a, a combination of some set of points. The interpolation, I'm always interpolating between, I'm taking a weighted average of the points, always. That's the interpretation of the basis function. And because those basis functions are sparse, they only activate a few of them at a time, and that gives you the, the ability to be weighted average of sequences of points. Okay? Yes, and it can be any dimension. So I said you can have guaranteed joint limits because joint limits are a convex constraint. You know, Q is less than something or whatever. I could do guaranteed velocity limits as long as those velocity limits are convex constraints. But I cannot guarantee that a non the collision, you know, if I had a non-convex constraint, the convex hull property is not enough to protect me from that. 
So for collision avoidance in a complex configuration space, the convex hull property can't save you from that. You can only rule out convex sets. If you have a convex constraint, then you're good. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. You're saying that that if my if I line things up, you know, start in the goal and there's a thin red wall. Oh, this way. Oh, good, good, good. Yes. I could definitely so I'm only satisfying non-collision constraints at these points. Sorry. Uh, in this particular example, I actually did satisfy them along the edge, but that's not always possible to do. Let me draw exactly. You you made a great point. So it is possible, I would say, you know, sometimes common, if my obstacle looked like this, you could find a solution, your optimizer could be perfectly happy with you, that did something like this. That's what you're saying, right? Right? Yeah. Because you're only checking the constraint satisfaction at those points. Yeah, that's a problem. So um, what people sometimes do is they will... Uh, They'll still parameterize the curve at only a handful of points, but they'll actually add constraints more densely. You know, so you can act actually add more constraints on the interpolated points. But at some point, uh, that's that's tough business, and you could so you often will check very densely before you execute it on the robot. But this can happen. Yeah, don't put thin walls around your expensive robot. No, that's a that's a real concern. Thank you for picking that up. Yes. So you sometimes you can decompose it and you can solve one, you know, but, but you're almost always when you choose to do that, you're always adding uh, you're you're taking away from the flexibility of the optim of the solver. So for instance, you know, if I wanted to like pick this up and I don't know, put it here and put it here. I don't know. And I didn't care exactly what the orientation of this was. That's probably a really bad example since everybody can't see in that plane. OK. Yeah, let's say I wanted to erase you know, here and then erase over here or something like this, OK? If I have to say, choose this point in the middle, then that is a less flexible optimization than something that is allowing me to like choose this middle point on the way to get it to accomplishing the long term. So it's, it tends to be better in the same, same way. If I had to pick a middle point to visit in order to break up that optimization, it's better if you can optimize all the way through. More expensive, but better. Uh, the, you're able to find lower cost paths. OK, so let me show you how this works for um, a couple of our examples here. No, I don't want to take a survey right now. OK. For additional fun, I'm still solving the other optimization problem in the background. <laughs> so two cores, good. OK, here's my um, initial condition reaching into one shelf, which I got from just solving an interest. Actually, I didn't even solve the inverse kinematics problem. I just said, I want your hand to be at that red, and I want to go to the hand at the blue. I just made a kinematic trajectory optimization. Just like we have an inverse kinematics class, we have a kinematic trajectory optimization class. I added those costs and constraints, and then I can find a path going from here to here. The black line, it was actually a visualization that showed the optimization as it was being solved. It just solved so fast that you didn't see that. Okay. Now, it's not actually completely Free. That makes it look, I don't, I don't want this to look better than it is. So actually, when I just solved the problem I said, it does something really, cr I could actually show you. It's kind of fun. Um, so I actually solve once without the collisions and then set it again with the collisions. I had to do it in this problem. You know, like I said, your mileage may vary, but that was, you know, this is what it did. Boom. <laughs> Right? 
And that was, it said it failed, but it also said this is the best I could do, <laughs> right? So in order to give it a better solution, I said salt, just pretend the shells are not there. It's an easy optimization. Use this as the initial guess for the next one, and then it found a beautiful solution. Right, but I mean, I couldn't have made a better, like, what you don't want to do with a robot by just solving an optimization <laughs> problem, right? It's like karate chopping the entire shell. I have to remember to take that back, you know. Um, okay, and then I just, for fun, I also made the clutter clearing that we started with. Remember how it was slow and inefficient? Oh, he left. Uh, the guy who said it was too slow doesn't get to see. Now we get beautiful, fast, you know, <laughs> whoom, you know, that would be moving mustard bottles like nobody's business, right? And just barely, and you have to sort of like inspect this to believe that it's collision free, right? Just barely missing those cameras, whoosh, right? Up to the velocity limits of the robot. I, I wouldn't run that on the robot. <laughs> I would. I would be a little bit more conservative with my distance constraints and stuff like that. But it's that one it solved with no, well, sorry, the one thing it had to do, I had to give it an initial guess, which was just in the comfortable position, it went like this, because sometimes it would go like this, you know? So I just said, do the simple thing. That one took me like 10 seconds to come up with, and it just worked. So I would say the takeaway is that the optimization-based trajectory optimization when it works, it's beautiful, like really good. And you have this rich library of costs and constraints, but you have to help it out along a little bit to find the right solution or to find any solution when it exists. So that is the reason we're going to talk about sample-based motion planning next time. I didn't write a constraint even. I just said the initial guess was a trajectory that went like this. I just fixed the position and rotated the lower base, the, the first joint, in a straight line. It was super simple. Yeah. Yeah. Up to local minima. So it, it could be that it's sh shortest, meaning no local change could make it better. You know, you know what, actually? I think that collision, I think it actually was speeding up because of exactly this point. I think that's why it was doing a dramatic kar karate chop, is because it was trying to get the spacing out of this long enough that it could teleport <laughs> through the. I think that's what happened, actually, because otherwise it wouldn't have made such a big motion, right? I think that's exactly what it did. So that's even that's even worse. It's not you know it's like it, it actually figured out to stretch the trajectory to make that true, right? Just to get through the shelves. I bet I bet if we plot it, that's what happened. Yeah. That's correct. That would be an easy constraint to add. To add saying that don't don't let it stretch too much. Constraint. Yeah. But I, that, I'm sure that's what it is, now that, now that we say it, yeah. Good, okay. See you next time.